Moscow's Cookbook and Speakeasy with Chef Justice Putnam. Netroomsradio.com Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des TR, des photos de bord de mer, de mon jardin d'hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, de mon jardin d'hiver. Election 2024 is less than a year away, and the matchup seems like it'll be a rematch of 2020. Joe Biden versus Donald Trump. But the prospect of another Trump term, its implications for America and democracy, is already setting off alarms. So much so, The Economist has labeled the former president, quote, the biggest danger to the world in 2024. According to the influential London-based magazine, quote, a second Trump term would be a watershed in a way the first was not. Victory would confirm his most destructive instincts about power. His plans would encounter less resistance. Remarkably, his plans and those of his enablers are being talked about openly. There was the bombshell report from the New York Times that revealed that Trump wants to use the Justice Department to exact revenge on his political adversaries. The New York Times also reported on plans for an extreme immigration crackdown that would include, quote, sweeping raids, giant camps and mass deportations. According to a new report from Axios, Trump allies are pre-screening the ideologies of thousands of potential Trump administration employees to expand Trump's power at every level of the U.S. government. And Trump is backing up these dangerous plans with violent rhetoric that should alarm anyone who cares about democracy and the rule of law. We pledge to you that we will root out the communists, Marxists, fascists, and the radical left thugs that live like vermin within the confines of our country. The real threat is not from the radical right. The real threat is from the radical left. And it's growing every day, every single day. The threat from outside forces is far less sinister, dangerous, and grave than the threat from within. Our threat is from within. Vermin. Historians have noted that Trump was parroting Adolf Hitler, with President Biden saying Trump's speech, quote, echoes language you heard in Nazi Germany in the 30s, and it isn't the first time. A Trump campaign spokesman called the comparison, quote, a ridiculous assertion. But that spokesperson also said this about his critics. Their sad, miserable existence will be crushed when President Trump returns to the White House. So let there be no doubt. A second Trump presidency could spell the end of the American experiment of democracy itself. And yet, a new NBC News poll out today shows Trump narrowly ahead of President Biden in a hypothetical general election matchup. Joining me now, Tim Miller, MSNBC political analyst, writer at large for The Bulwark, and author of Why We Did It, a travel log from the Republican road to hell. Miles Taylor, former DHS chief of staff, co-founder of the Forward Party, and author of Blowback, a warning to save democracy from the next Trump. And Susan Glasser, staff writer at The New Yorker and co-author of 
the divider. Thank you all very much for coming to the Sunday show. Um, who's first on the screen? I think it's Tim. But I want all of you to give me your reaction to the new NBC News poll that shows Trump narrowly ahead of President Biden. It's within the margin of error, but in a general election matchup, especially in light of Trump's increasingly alarming rhetoric. Well, Jonathan, uh, there's no doubt it's alarming and it's dispiriting uh, to see those numbers. Uh, I think it's also important to put them in context. Uh, we're a year out. Uh, as you see there, neither of those candidates are approaching 50 percent. I think uh, if you just look at the polls and analyze the polls, a big or maybe not big, but a significant portion of what is holding President Biden down uh, in his ballot number is people that are within the Democratic coalition, um, voters of color, younger voters, uh, people that are maybe upset about um, uh, pers the persistent inflation, even though it's coming down, or maybe upset about uh, actions in, in Gaza from the administration. Uh, you would think that once most of those from that group learn about Donald Trump's plans and that feels more of an acute threat to them as we get closer to next year, a lot of them would come back on board. Uh, but you hate to make a bet like that when the stakes are so high. Right. Uh, Miles. Yeah, look, I, I think at this point, it's realistic to say, Jonathan, that it's a coin flip about whether Donald Trump becomes president of the United States again. That's jarring. It's very worrying. It could, as you say, represent, frankly, the end of the American experiment. But the only way those numbers might change is if voters have a very clear eyed view of what a second term might mean. And I think that's the critical thing. Uh, that's needed right now is for someone to paint that picture. I tried to do it in my most recent book. People are trying to do it now. But look, Donald Trump's out there saying who he is going to be and painting that picture. And hopefully it leads voters to wake up. Because when you go department by department uh, about what would happen in a second Trump term, there's only one takeaway you can have, which is he wants to use the entirety of the federal government to exact revenge against his rivals and to implement an extreme view of America that systematically undermines the institutions of our democratic republic. It's as bad as it gets. We've never seen anything like this in American history. And now's a time of choosing. The question is, will the American people wake up? Mm -hmm. and, and Susan would love your reaction to these new poll numbers, but especially to Tim's point, we are a year out. Well, that's right. I mean, I look at that 46 percent number for Donald Trump. And what that says to me is that Republicans are sticking with their candidate. Remember that 46 percent is basically exactly what Donald Trump received in the 2020 election uh, mm. and not that different uh, from what he received a bit more in the 2016 election. The Republican coalition has made a choice to stick with Donald Trump, notwithstanding his unprecedented effort to overturn the legal results of uh, an American election and all the other things, not including four indictments and the like. The difference is that Democrats and Democratic minded independents are sending a message right now, which is that they're not yet comfortable. They're not yet on board with Joe Biden in the next year. And so it's really a focus on what can Biden do to bring the Democratic coalition back. You know, there's a strong argument that there's a certain there's a ceiling for Donald Trump. The question is, uh, if the fraying of the Democratic coalition is such that that ceiling would still be enough to elect Donald Trump. And meanwhile, we're playing Russian roulette with democracy. I do think this is an extremely important point. The stakes here could not be higher. And, you know, to your point, Susan, the, the NBC News poll does say while Biden's support has changed throughout the year, albeit within the margin of error, Trump's has barely budged in the poll to sort of amplifying what you just said. Tim, you recently interviewed former Trump White House chief, chief strategist Steve Bannon on Showtime's The Circus. Let's listen. A MAGA lawyer likes to come on your podcast, Mike Davis. Here's what he has suggested are the top priorities for Trump's attorney general. One, fire the deep state executive branch. Two, indict the whole Biden family. Three, deport 10 million people, kids in cages. That will be glorious. Four, detain people at Gitmo. Five, pardon every January 6th defendant. What do you think about that five step plan? I think plan? it's fantastic. We all five? All five. So we've all been talking about, <clears throat> uh, you know, potential extreme Trump policies. 
there they are talking about them so brazenly, so openly. Tim, what do you make of the fact that folks have no qualms talking about very extreme anti-small D Democratic rule of law plans that they have for a potential Trump second term? Yeah, I, I think the main takeaways here is that he's going to have the most radical and the most reactionary folks around him. I, I think that Miles can speak to this, right? Last time, there were a lot of those people scattered through the administration, but there were a lot of other folks as well that were trying to put the bumpers on the on you know the bowling lane, and um, that worked at times, didn't work at other times. But uh, I, that those bumpers will be off next time, and the Bannon and the Mike Davises of the world are going to be the types of people that will be around him and that will be in charge. I think that's alarming. I, I think they feel very confident about their political standing to be able to speak like this and i guess it'd be one thing for steve bannon who's a provocateur and has a his podcast etc to to say these sorts of things but for people around trump to say them for advisors to trump people that are, are actively working to help him win i think tells you they feel confident about their political standing and that they're not going to be abashed this time and and limited in, in the scope of these very anti uh, we say anti-democratic, but it's really anti, anti-rule of law and very fascistic efforts to, to jail enemies and, you know, create these sprawling deportation efforts that far exceed, you know, what, what he attempted to do last time. Mm-hmm. Um, Miles, I'm going to come to you with, with another question on the other side of the break. But Susan, uh, before we go to this break, we've got about a minute left. Uh, Trump's rhetoric is beyond alarming. Not only did he did he use the word vermin a few weeks ago, he said that undocumented immigrants were, quote, poisoning the blood of our country, end quote. Again, echoing language used by Hitler. Why should the American people take him literally and seriously when he talks like this? Jonathan, the dehumanizing rhetoric that Donald Trump employs, which, by the way, he has done throughout his political career. Uh, I remember writing a whole column when he was president about calling enemies human scum. You know who else uses this rhetoric? It's not just Hitler. It's the worst dictators in history. Those are the only people. When you look to find other examples of democratically elected leaders using this language, you will not find it. And the reason is because it's not democratic. Fundamentally, what is, is the language of a strong man who is inciting followers to believe that their opponents are subhuman. It is a call in a way to violence. It is a call to be able to do whatever you want in the name of defeating those opponents. It is a prelude in many societies to disaster. And listening to that clip, to me, it was chilling. It was as if I was hearing a live speech from Joseph Stalin. It, it was that scary. It is Monday. The 20th of November of 2023, and you are in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. I am your chef de cuisine, Justice Putnam. Gunner, the English Bulldog, is our snoozing sous chef. Precious the Little Yorkie is our door girl, and she will be seeing you directly for our especially special daily special, River City Hash Mondays. That's right. Had quite a weekend, and it looks like we're having quite a week coming up, considering that it is a holiday week, so to speak. (laughs) How are you? I took a little bit of time this morning to uh, tune in to the arguments at the appellate level over Trump's gag order. They're broadcasting the audio from the courtroom, no video, but you do get audio. And... I know that one should not ever take what, uh, you know, the line of questioning that the judges, the justices are are, uh, lining up with as being a tell to how they will uh, rule uh, in the trial. And since I didn't get to hear or when I had to say, I could, OK, I have to stop because I got to focus in on what we're doing here in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Uh, I didn't get a chance to hear any of uh, the government's argument, but listening to the sour guy, I like that name, sour. Um, the, apparently he was a solicitor general. Was it Wisconsin? I can't. He was a solicitor general of some somewhere here in the States and uh, his, his contentious argument with the justices was quite something and they were giving it back. And what was kind of curious to me, and they called him out on it many times, let alone they, well, they didn't quite, well, they did 
call him out on a few, shall we say, misrepresentations of the facts. But um, uh, the point I want to make before I get to that point is that the judges, uh, all three of them, kept reminding him, you know, you're citing case law from the side that lost. <laughs> what are you doing? Oh, well, that doesn't matter. You know, we have to take the, you know, the other argument because, you know, no, you don't. Because what the, what the, the, uh, justices then had adjudicated upon the facts is this. And the guy's arguing the counter argument as if because it was argued in front of a court on the highest level that that has some sort of special properties that he can use now to prove his case. And they're saying, actually, no, the case law that you're uh, citing doesn't prove your case. It proves the exact opposite. But this is the point that I've been making for quite a while. They don't care or respect our institutions. The guy came out and said, there has been no direct threat to this judge in this case whatsoever. And when it was pointed out, well, actually, a woman was just arrested and she's serving time in jail right now for doing it. And then, then his argument is like, oh, well, she was some lady sitting on her couch six hours a day drinking. Oh, really? So that makes it okay then. Trump making these threats directly to or about a judge, and then that judge gets attacked directly. What they didn't point out is that it's not just this one lady who has threatened uh, this judge in, in New York, this district judge, Chetkin. But this is the one that made such a vile threat that was looked like it could be acted upon, and so then uh, the government acted on her. And this guy's up there saying, oh, it doesn't matter. It doesn't, you know, if he says something like generally, it doesn't matter anything to this case to with this judge. This is the mob argument. This is the argument the mob keeps giving. So I could ask rhetorically, where are we? And we know exactly where we are. All right. Well. And then there's the uh, the local issue here that uh, about our our government schools. <laughs> yeah, uh, we we have a you know money from the Inflation Reduction Act that's going to help us fix some infrastructure around our schools. And one of the things they're going to do here is uh, have like a sort of like a medical center of sorts. Basically, what it is is going to fund the school nurse. But apparently, the school nurse, according to some really weird people, is a groomer trying to convince kids that they should change their sex. <laughs> what the hell? And they say that I'm, like, divisive in the community. Give me a break. The only reason I'm divisive in the community is because there's a lot of us who think that that is batshit crazy and too many people are afraid to mention it because you might have somebody armed to the hilt coming up there and say, c coming up to you and saying, you can't see that in a conservative town. And I say, you know what? Yes, you can. And who says it's a conservative town? You Okay, I thought I lived in, in America, okay? And when I mention sundown town and these people go, when they finally figure out what I'm talking about, and they go, oh, that's not what we're doing, except that's exactly what they're doing when they come up to people and say, you better not see that after dark. Okay, I got gotcha. you. So we live in, as I've mentioned before, perilous times. And uh, I guess we we should go vote. <laughs> Damn right. And counter the absolute lying MAGA Nazi agitprop. I'll just mention very quickly in this school government school thing, uh, the abortion issue was raised. And then these I don't know, it's guys saying 
that, uh, you know, they have like abortion on demand up to and beyond birth. And I said, that's medically impossible. And I'm accused of allowing the murder of babies. Woman's right to choose has nothing to do with murdering babies. And give me a break. A woman's going to go to term. And before or after she's had the baby, she's going to go, oh, I guess I don't want it now. I don't want to have it. Birth control. This is what these idiots think. Point it out. And boy, do they go batshit crazy. Jesus. <sighs> One other thing is that what's really bad about getting old is that when the Nazi takeover of America finally happened, I'm physically incapable of really doing anything about it. How about you? God, I hate feeling this helpless. I won't allow it to happen. I just won't. Okay. All right. Well, we can do what we can do. And uh, so we'll keep doing it. And what we're doing at this very moment is that we are going to give you a rundown on what we have in store for you here in the Bistro Cafe as we begin this fabulous River City Hash Mondays. Moms for Liberty reported over two million bucks in revenue with the bulk of contributions coming from just two donors. Now, of course, at the top, that was Trump ramping up his dangerous rhetoric on the 2024 campaign trail. And, uh, yeah, <laughs> when they tell him, like, you got to, like, you know, tone it down, you know, he doubles down because that's what autocrats do. It's the Orban model, by the way. Mississippi's capital city, you know, Jackson, the one that uh, the governor there wants to say, oh, you can't have your own government. You're black. <laughs> well, they're considering a unique plan to slash rates for poor people. Well, we'll find out what that's about. And fears of political violence are growing as the 2024 campaign heats up and conspiracy theories evolve. And it's coming from the top. After the break, we move to the chef's table where the Moscow Times, noted for its English coverage of Russia, is declared a foreign agent. And we know what happens when that happens in Russia. And censored art from around the world finds a second opportunity at a Barcelona museum for banned works. All that and more on West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Trump uh, at the appellate level there on his gag order uh, was the solicitor general of Missouri, not Wisconsin. OK, glad we cleared that up near the bottom of our home page at netrisradio.com. Off to the right of the page is the chat room link monitored by Kelly Lincoln. And we thank Kelly for doing so and so much more across the page to the left from that chat room link near the bottom of our homepage at netrootsradio.com is the link to our Patreon page. And if you could become a recurring Patreon of Netroots Radio, it really does help, especially in these perilous times where the bills keep increasing. And so your help is greatly appreciated. And thank you for doing so. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, Mastodon, uh, Spoutable, Blue Sky. I, well, actually, we're not quite on Blue Sky yet, but we will be. Also on Facebook, of course. You can do so by following us at Netroots Radio. Tom takes care of that, except for Facebook, because Kelly takes care of that. So you'll see. Thank you guys for doing everything that you do. Follow me on all those social media platforms and more 
at Justice Putnam. I incidentally post the show notes on Link's diary on Daily Kos 10 minutes before showtime, and uh, that's where you can have quick access. Uh, by following my social media feeds, you'll have quick access to those show notes and links diaries on Daily Coast, where you can read the actual articles by the actual reporters. If you would like to follow Netroots Radio on Twitter, it's just just a place, Matt, but we're we're working on it. You can do so at Cookbook West, and most importantly, if you could pick up podcasts by way of Spreaker, TuneIn, iHeart, YouTube, iTunes, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that would be nice. So do so. Uh, you'll just not be able to find any podcasts on Stitcher. Okay, just won't be able to. Can't. This first offering here in the Bistro Cafe of Inside Jokes. Okay, we have a lot of inside jokes here, and that one's a recurring one every morning. All right, this first stop right here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy is out of the Associated Press by Allie Swenson. Let's see, the Moms for Liberty Parental Rights. Now, that's in quotation marks, okay, because we know what parental rights means. A nonprofit reported $2.1 million in total revenue in 2022, a big leap from the previous year that was made possible primarily through contributions from Two anonymous mega donors. They're always anonymous little cowards. And that's according to a tax filing provided to the Associated Press over the weekend. The dramatic increase was up from three hundred and seventy grand in revenue the previous year when it was founded, and reveals the financial footprint of the polarizing group's massive nationwide growth. Well, we'll see what happens with that. That includes high-profile events over the past year with prominent conservative groups and Republican political candidates. Well, if they can't get their way, they're going to make money at it anyway. So there. Since its founding in 2021, Moms for Liberty has amassed vigorous support from some conservatives who support its efforts to target references to race and LGBTQ plus identity in schools across the country. Is that what it is? I don't think it's supposed to actually target references. They are targeting the actual people, friends, and family. At the same time, the group has generated forceful backlash from grassroots groups and anti-hate organizations who argue its activism stirs extremist ideas and harms minority and LGBTQ plus students. Wait a second. Grassroots groups and anti-hate organizations? You mean moms and dads who go to school board meetings and, 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 and tell the school board, stop bullying my kid? Jesus. The tax filing shows that most of the group's 2022 revenue, nearly $2 million of it, came from contributions and grants that earned smaller sums from educational activities, about $68,000, and merchants' dye sales made almost a hundred grand on that. While Moms for Liberty is a 501c4 nonprofit and therefore is not required to disclose its donors, documents and disclosures from other organizations re reveal some of its 2022 funders were well-known Right-wing groups and donors, the Conservative Heritage Foundation, they're everywhere. Their tax filing showed in 2022 it gave Moms for Liberty about twenty-five grand when it awarded the group its annual Salvatore Prize for Citizenship. And the Leadership Institute, which has trained conservative politicians from former Vice President Mike Pence, Hank Mike Pence, to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, you know, the the uh, the Grim Reaper of the Senate, said on his website that it was the top sponsor for Mons for Liberty's 2022 National Summit. While the group's filing doesn't name donors, it does show Mons for Liberty received some large contributions in 2022 including one donation of one million bucks and another donation of five hundred thousand dollars two point one million more than half of it came from two people i wonder who they were we can only imagine
Goldberg of the Associated Press brings us this next offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. The manager of the long troubled water system in Mississippi's capital city proposed a slight rate increase for most residents on Friday, alongside what he said is a first in the nation proposal to reduce water rates for low income people who get government help with grocery bills. The proposal from Ted Hennepin, the third party manager of Jackson's Water and Sewer Systems, is the culmination of a months long effort to increase revenue collection in a city where roughly a quarter of the population lives in poverty. If enacted, it would be the latest in a series of changes of after infrastructure breakdowns in 2022 caused many Jackson residents to go days and weeks without safe running water. And if said about 5,000 properties in the Jackson area use water without paying, adding to the financial strain on the system that has about $260 million in outstanding debts. To increase revenue collections without burdening those who can't afford higher bills, Hennepin's proposal creates a new a new rate tier for the roughly 12,500 Jackson Water customers who receive benefits from the Federal Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, otherwise known as SNAP, which helps low-income people purchase groceries. People who receive SNAP benefits, also known as food stamps, will see their water bills lowered by an average of $20 a month. That arrangement does not exist anywhere in the country, Hennepin said. Hennepin had previously floated a plan to price water based on property values to shift the burden away from Jackson's poorest residents. Months later, the Mississippi legislature passed a law banning that approach. State law now mandates that water be billed based on volume, not other factors like property values. Hennepin said Lieutenant Governor Delbert Horseman, who presides over the state Senate, approves of this new proposal. Brings us this final offering here in the Bistro Cafe of West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. The man who bludgeoned former House Speaker Nancy Pelosi's husband with a hammer last year consumed a steady diet of right wing conspiracy theories before an attack that took place with the midterm elections less than two weeks away. As the 2024 presidential campaign heats up, experts on extremism fear the threat of politically motivated violence will intensify. From Pizzagate to QAnon to Stop the Steal, conspiracy theories that demonize Trump's enemies are morphing and spreading. As the frontrunner of the 2024 Republican nomination aims for a return to the White House. No longer are these conspiracy theories and very divisive and vicious ideologies separated at the fringes, said Jacob Ware, a research fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations whose focus on is on domestic terrorism. They're now infiltrating American society on a massive scale. Well, welcome to the party, pal. A federal grand jury on Thursday convicted David DePap of attacking Paul Pelosi at his San Francisco home on October 28th of 2022. Before the verdict, DePap testified that he intended to hold Nancy Pelosi hostage and break her kneecaps. 
if the Democratic lawmaker lied to him while he questioned her about what he viewed as government corruption. She fortunately was in Washington at the time of the assault. In online rants before the attack, DePap echoed tenets of QAnon, a pro-Trump conspiracy theory that has been linked to killings and other crimes. A core belief belief for QAnon adherents is that Trump is, has tried to expose a Satan-worshipping, child sex trafficking, trafficking cabal of prominent Democrats and Hollywood elites. Trump has amplified social media accounts that promote QAnon, which grew from the far-right fringes of the Internet to become a fixture of mainstream Republican politics. That is what they have become. Do we allow them to continue telling us what to do? No. And just remember, they project. (laughs) Everything they accuse their opponents of doing, they are doing. Everything that they accuse their opponents of about what they are about to do, they are about to do. Okay. Got that off my chest. And since I did, why don't we go to our break? And when we get back from that break, we will go through weather from around the world. And we will finish up with the stories that we have curated for you today. You are listening to West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. And we will be right back. You are listening to NetworksRadio.com. Please hang up and try again. From a point at sea to the circles of your mind, a new force is at work for planetary transformation. New radio for a new Earth. This is Take Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. This week, my marvelous guesses. There are so many moving parts to feature films, so many cooks, so many masters, so many schedules, so many deadlines. Anytime you see a good movie, you should be amazed. And anytime you see a great movie, you should celebrate a miracle. And The Marvels reminds me of that. Because it's okay. It's fun. But it's not as good as what I've come to expect from Marvel Cinemas. And I smell money. My guess is things were done or not done because the dollars didn't support what made sense. Because, and I hope it was different for you, I could see good parts, but for me the film just didn't click. First off, the tone felt unfocused, and maybe it was having to wrangle these three characters. Because Kamala Khan is all quirky and cute and funny and small and local, but also earnest and family, family, family. While Carol Danvers is epic and the baddest person in the room with a little bit of wry humor on the side. And Monica Rambeau is... She hasn't had enough spotlight time to define her tone yet. That's a hard mix to make gel. And speaking of hard mixes, this edit felt squished. The movie was so fast, like there wasn't enough time to get everything done. And seriously, like there was a Captain Marvel 2 that should have been made but wasn't. Because the Marvel suffered even more than Captain Marvel from a lot of telling and not showing. The movie was like, oh, by the way, Carol did this really bad thing that she's haunted about, and that's why she hasn't come back to Earth in a long time. Oh, and by the way, Carol hasn't come back to Earth in a long time, and that's why Monica's upset with her. Oh, and by the way, Monica's upset with Carol. Did we mention that? So I think the emotional moments didn't land for me because I hadn't had enough experiential basis to invest in them. Also, I'm still not over the fact that they didn't just make Carol and Maria Rambo lovers in Captain Marvel. It would have worked much better, and in the Marvels, Monica would get, I lost my mom and my other mom wasn't there for me, which plays better and stronger than, I could have really used our family friend. Oh well, I'm sympathetic. I only have two minutes. This has been Take-Two Movie Review. I'm Clinton Johnston. Catch up with us at TakeTwoMovieReview.com and feed us back on our channel on YouTube. This program is presented by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Welcome to A Cup of Health with CDC, a weekly feature of the MMWR, the Morbidity and Mortality Weekly Report. I'm your host, Dr. Robert Gaines. Too many people are overindulging in alcohol and putting themselves at risk for death from alcohol poisoning. 
Dr. Daphna Kani is an epidemiologist with CDC's alcohol program in the National Center for Chronic Disease Prevention and Health Promotion. She's joining us today to discuss the dangers of binge drinking, including alcohol poisoning death. Welcome to the show, Daphna. Thank you for having me. Daphna, let's start with what is binge drinking? Binge drinking is a dangerous pattern of alcohol consumption that is defined as four more drinks for women on an occasion, five or more drinks for men on an occasion, usually in a short period of time. Uh, Binge drinking is the most common and most deadly pattern of excessive alcohol use, and most binge drinkers are not alcohol dependent. Uh, Binge drinking has many risks, and one of which is death from alcohol poisoning. How common are deaths from alcohol poisoning in the U.S.? More than 2,200 people die from alcohol poisoning each year in the United States, which translates to an average of six deaths each day. Who is most at risk for death from alcohol poisoning? Three in four alcohol poisoning deaths involve adults ages 35 to 64, and most of the deaths are among men. Non-Hispanic whites has uh, the most number of deaths from alcohol poisoning, though alcohol poisoning death rates are highest among American Indians and Alaska Natives. About um, 70% of the deaths were among those who were not alcohol dependent. Daphna, what are the signs of life-threatening alcohol poisoning? When drinking a large amount of alcohol in a short period of time, it can result in very high levels of alcohol in the body, which can shut down critical areas of the brain that control breathing, heart rate, and body temperature. The life-threatening signs and symptoms of alcohol poisoning include an inability to wake up, vomiting, seizures, slow or irregular breathing, and low body temperature. What are some ways to prevent deaths from alcohol poisoning? First and foremost, don't binge drink. If you choose to drink, do so in moderation, up to one drink a day for women, up to two drinks a day for men, and get help for anyone experiencing life-threatening signs of alcohol poisoning. The key to prevent alcohol poisoning death is to prevent binge drinking. Where can listeners get more information about binge drinking and alcohol poisoning? You can find more information at cdc.gov slash alcohol. Thanks, Daphna. I've been talking today with CDC's Dr. Daphna Kani about the dangers of binge drinking and alcohol poisoning. Remember, more than 2,200 Americans die each year from alcohol poisoning. Life-threatening signs of alcohol poisoning include vomiting, seizures, inability to wake up, slowed or irregular breathing or heart rate, and bluish skin tone. For anyone exhibiting these signs, call 911 or get the person to a health care facility immediately. Until next time, be well. This is Dr. Robert Gaines for A Cup of Health with CDC. For the most accurate health information, visit www.cdc.gov or call 1-800-CDC-INFO. One in six Americans gets sick from eating contaminated food each year. Contamination caused by salmonella is especially common. It's sometimes found in poultry, eggs, ground beef, pork, and even peanut butter. To reduce your risk from this and other foodborne germs, remember to clean, separate, cook, and chill. Clean your hands with soap and water. Separate raw meat, poultry, and seafood from other foods. Wash counters, cutting boards, and utensils before and after using them. Cook all food thoroughly and use a food thermometer to make sure food is cooked. Promptly chill meat, poultry, eggs, and other perishables. Finally, don't prepare food for others if you're sick, and be extra careful when you prepare food for children, pregnant women, the elderly, or people in poor health. To learn more about making food safer to eat, visit www.cdc.gov slash vital signs. Hi, I'm Tom Harbin, and since you're listening to NetRootsRadio.com, show your progressive side and go to the Donate button on the bottom of the homepage. It's progressives like you who power NetRoots Radio and keep the progressive message beaming everywhere 24 hours a day. Just go to our Donate button at the bottom of NetRootsRadio.com. Thank you. 
for keeping Progressive Radio at full power. Why should we care that an Alabama DA has brought criminal charges against a small-town newspaper publisher and reporter? I'm Bill Newman, and this is the Civil Liberties Minute. The Atmore Alabama News printed a truthful and accurate story about an investigation that the local DA has been conducting about the Escambia County School Board. Truthful and accurate. In response, the DA charged the publisher and reporter with disclosing grand jury information. The problem? While grand jurors may well have an obligation to remain silent, newspapers are not grand jurors. Newspapers have a very different obligation. Newspapers have the obligation and the right to inform the public. And newspapers, we've understood, have the right to publish grand jury information, as long as they didn't use illegal means to obtain it. Here, the DA has not alleged any such thing. As one press freedom organization put it, if the Nixon administration couldn't imprison journalists who printed the Pentagon Papers, the Alabama DA can't imprison journalists for writing stories about the Atmore, Alabama school board. And then the story gets worse. As a condition of release on bond, the judge imposed a prior restraint order prohibiting the reporter and the paper's publisher from printing any more stories relating to a grand jury unless the information already is first a public record. Teaching us that freedom of the press, or not, as a practical matter, may depend on where you live. The Civil Liberties Minute is made possible by the ACLU, because freedom can't protect itself. You're listening to the American Democracy Minute, keeping your government by and for the people. In 2014, a New York constitutional amendment created the New York Independent Redistricting Commission. But the redistricting commission lacked both independence and authority, and the 2021 maps ended up in the legislature and ultimately the courts. The congressional map was in court again last week. New York's commission was set up with 10 members, two appointed by the assembly speaker, two by the assembly minority leader, two by the Senate majority leader, and two by the Senate minority leader. Two other nonpartisan members are chosen by the other eight. The commission, however, is only advisory. The assembly can vote down the commission maps twice, then must create its own. On its inaugural run, the commission deadlocked. When Democrats took control of both houses of the legislature, it rejected both maps drawn by the commission and drew its own gerrymandered maps. Republicans sued, and a court-appointed special master drew the maps used in the 2022 midterms, giving Republicans four additional seats in Congress. November 15th, a seven-judge panel heard an appeal claiming the redistricting commission didn't fulfill its constitutional duty and must be allowed to redraw the maps. The decision, expected shortly, could impact the balance of the U.S. House. Could this mess have been avoided? We'll describe California's successful approach in our next report. We have more on New York's ill-fated redistricting process at AmericanDemocracyMinute.org. I'm Brian Beal. I'm Rick Smith, and this is Labor History in Two. On this day in labor history, the year was 1896. That was the day anarchist and labor activist Rose Posada was born. Her name, Raquel Piasotti, was changed like so many others at Ellis Island. She had fled Tsarist Russia in 1913 as a teenager and soon found work in New York City's garment shops. She readily joined the ILGWU, becoming a national organizer by 1920. In the late 1920s, Rose went to Los Angeles in an attempt to organize Latina sweatshop workers. There, she helped women workers establish a bilingual labor journal and assisted them in winning a key strike for recognition and higher wages in 1933. She soon ascended to the position of union vice president and worked closely with the newly formed CIO. Rose traveled far and wide to organize garment workers. She led successful strikes throughout the United States and in Montreal and Puerto Rico. By 1936, she was on the picket lines with striking rubber workers in Akron, Ohio, and auto workers in Flint, Michigan. She increasingly found herself at odds with ILGWU head Dave Dubinsky and other top male union officials over persistent sexism, her radical politics, and her opposition to the no-strike pledge during World War II. Rose resented the fact that though women comprised the overwhelming 
overwhelming majority of the union's membership, she continued to be the only woman union officer. Frustrated by the chauvinism she experienced, Rose resigned from her post as vice president and later from the ILGWU executive board in 1944. She continued as a sewing machine operator, remained active at the local level, and published two memoirs. Later in life, she aligned herself with the civil rights movement. Rose Posada died of cancer in 1965. Labor History in Two brought to you by the Illinois Labor History Society and the Rick Smith Show. Thank you for accompanying us here to the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy, River City Hash Mondays. We always begin weather from around the world along the banks of the Rogue River in the Rogue River Valley of Southern Oregon on the west coast of the continental United States of America, where it is currently 34 degrees Fahrenheit, expecting highs only in the mid-50s. We are currently under foggy conditions and we'll have cloudy skies followed by partial clearing later on. Winds light and variable. We are under an active advisory for an air stagnation alert, which means that our air is going to be stagnant in valleys throughout Southern Oregon. So if you are in similar conditions, do take care. Partly cloudy this evening with more clouds overnight. Lows in the mid to upper 30s. Winds light and variable. Then some clouds in the morning tomorrow will give way to mainly sunny skies for the afternoon. Highs in the low 60s. Winds light and variable. Pollen is rated as none here in our little town of Rogue River. The air quality index for the region is in the good range at 21 parts per million, and that daytime UV index is low at level 2. Barometric pressure is rising at 30.44 inches as a high-pressure system swirls nearby. It looks like uh, visibility is down to a half mile, and relative humidity is at 98%. Weather from around the world is brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world, and that is the weather underground. London is 53 degrees and cloudy. Paris is 52 degrees and cloudy. Rome is 65 and mostly cloudy with a advisory for... Potential disruption due to thunderstorms. Looks like Bagram is 45 and clear. Kiev is 28 and mostly cloudy. Hong Kong is 66 degrees and fair. Tokyo is 51 degrees and clear. Melbourne, Victoria, Australia is 60 degrees and cloudy. San Francisco, California is 56 and sunny. Chicago, Illinois is 45 degrees and mostly cloudy. And New York, New York is 43 degrees Fahrenheit, sunny with a gale warning. And that is weather from around the world, brought to you by a crowd of crowdsourced weather stations that a crowd crowdsources from around the world. at the 
Associated Press brings us this first amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy River City Hash Mondays. Russia's Justice Ministry added the Moscow Times, an online newspaper popular among Russia's expatriate community, to its list of foreign agents in the country's continuing crackdown on critical news media and opposition. The foreign agent designation subjects individuals and organizations to increased financial scrutiny and requires any of their public material to prominently include notice of being declared a foreign agent. The label is seen as a pejorative aimed at undermining the designee's credibility. It was not immediately clear how the move would affect the Moscow Times, which moved its editorial operations out of Russia in 2022 after the passage of a law imposing stiff penalties for material regarded as discrediting the Russian military and its war in Ukraine. The Moscow Times publishes in English and in Russian, but its Russian language site was blocked in Russia several months after the Ukraine war began. The publication began in 1992 as a daily print paper distributed for free in restaurants, hotels, and other locations popular with expatriates, whose presence in Moscow was soaring after the collapse of the Soviet Union. It later reduced its print edition to weekly, then became online only in 2017. Russia, in recent years, has methodically methodically targeted people and organizations critical of the Kremlin, branding them as foreign agents and some as undesirable under a 2015 law that makes membership in such organizations a criminal offense. Je te donne ce mon amour pour la vie entière La promesse de me trouver à tes genoux Aussitôt que tu m'appelles, rester toujours fidèle C'est tout, c'est tout Je te donne tous mes printemps, mes étés de mer Mes automnes, quand les feuilles tombent partout Si ce n'est pas une bonne affaire Je te donne tous mes hivers Joseph Wilson of the Associated Press brings us this final amuse-bouche here at the chef's table at West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. A drawing of a new Donald Trump. A punching bag sculpture shaped like a woman's torso. A display of women's party shoes standing proudly on prayer rugs. All are pieces of contemporary art that have provoked debate and sometimes violent reactions. These pieces and dozens more that were subjected to some sort of censorship have found a home in Spain at Barcelona's Museum of Forbidden Art or the Musée de la Art Prohibit in Catalan. And I don't know if that's how it's pronounced, but I got I I'm, 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 I think I'm close. <laughs> the collection of over 200 works, including ones by well-known creators such as American photographer Robert Maplethorpe and Spain's own Pablo Picasso, is intended to challenge visitors and question the limits imposed on artists in an increasingly polarized world. Is that what it is? Director Rosa Rodriguez. Rodrigo said the museum is the only one in the world dedicated exclusively to art that face petitions, often successful ones, for their removal from public view on moral, political, religious, sexual, or commercial grounds. This museum gives an opportunity to works of art that, for whatever reason, at some point have been banned, attacked, censored, or canceled because... There are so many, Rodrigo told the Associated Press. The museum is a creation of Catalan art collector Taxco Bennett, who owns all but one of the 42 works currently on display and the 200 more in storage. He was already collecting contemporary art when he began gathering band works. Five years later, Bennett's idea became the Museum of Forbidden Art, 
which opens its doors in October. Since then, over 13,000 people have visited its galleries. As more works come under attack, people like art critic and curator Gabrielle Luciani say the exhibit is essential. I think it's imperative to have a place like this in Europe and around the world, especially in these moments of censorship that we're seeing, not only in the arts, but also in other political contexts. Well, that brings us to the end of our broadcast period for the day, but you do know Netroots Radio broadcasts on, and we will meet up here tomorrow for Terrytown Chowder Tuesdays. So do stay tuned to Netroots Radio all day and all night for all the breaking news as it breaks. And we will meet up here tomorrow, right here, in West Coast Cookbook and Speakeasy. Bon Appetit. Je voudrais du soleil vert, des dentelles et des théères, des photos de bord de mer, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais de la lumière, comme en Nouvelle-Angleterre. Je veux changer d'atmosphère, d'un manche à d'un hiver. Je voudrais du frais d'Astère Revoir un latte coël Je voudrais toujours te plaire Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je veux déjeuner par terre Comme au long de golfe clair T'embrasser les yeux ouverts Dans mon jardin d'hiver Je te dis